Good morning, Rayma Family Church. Welcome to another live streaming. It's going to be a great day. Today I've asked Patsy to minister, but I still wanted to greet you, say hello, and let you know you're in my heart. And uh, myself and Patsy, we're praying for you guys. As a matter of fact, I'd even just like to pray a few things right now. So if you can agree with this after I ask these things. Uh, first of all, Father, I thank you, Father, and I ask that everyone's needs would be abundantly supplied and uh, that there would just be miracles and, and supply coming from unexpected places during this time that we're in. Father, I also thank you that people, the, Jesus, you're the Prince of Peace, and I thank you that you overwhelm people with peace, not problems. There's not an overwhelming of problems, but there's an overwhelming of peace. I thank you for that for each person. And then, Father, lastly, I thank you that you would lead people by your Spirit, uh, lead them into fruitfulness, to lost souls, to get them saved, into victory, safety, and abundance. And I pray these things, and if you can agree with that, can you say amen in Jesus' name. This is Anzac Weekend, and we like to honor the Anzacs. So here's a video to honor those that served. They went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch, to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We thank you, Lord, for those who have served their nation. In John 15, 13, you said, The greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. We acknowledge all the men and women who daily lay down their lives for their God and their country. We pray for them today and their families. Bless them, Lord, and keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give, and I will ever love and 
trust him in his presence daily Give life, you alive. 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore the soul. Every heart, every heart that is broken. She prays. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out. It's so great to be with you again at uh, our online service. And uh, I want to make sure that you know all the ways that you can connect with God. Because at Rhema Family Church, we are connecting with God and connecting with each other. Now, I got an email from Pastor Tony Friday morning, and it was the weekly newsletter with all the updates. And I was really excited because there was something in there that I wasn't expecting. A brand new church app for Rhema Family Church. 
So I downloaded it straight away, probably before you, it was before 5 a.m. on Friday morning. I'm just that kind of on top of it guy. And uh, in there, there's absolutely everything that you need to connect with us. There's how to give, there's all your connect groups that you can join, prayer groups and all those different kinds, the uh, youth groups and announcements, all of Pastor Tony's blogs, absolutely everything you're looking for. Now, if you haven't got that newsletter yet, uh, then head to the webpage, uh, rhema.org.au forward slash live. And not only will you be able to send us an email there so we can add you to the uh, mailing list, but you'll also be able to download the app. You'll be sent, a, you'll put in your phone number and uh, we'll send you a text message straight to your phone so you can download the Rhema Family Church app direct to your phone and make sure you're getting connected as much as possible. It's very important to be doing this. We don't want you to be just watching a TV show. That's not what church is. It's all about connecting with God and connecting with each other at Rhema Family Church. So we're about to come into our time of just gathering around the Lord's Supper, communion. And we're going to take a break just for 60 seconds and while we give you time to go and grab some symbols to represent the Lord's body broken for you and his blood shed for us. We'll be right back in a minute. Broken body offered up for me purchased healing when you hung upon the tree and now sickness and disease they have no place in me by the stripes on your body totally set free you paid a wholesome price you gave abundant life to me so i Whatever you've got at home to represent his body and his blood, it's okay. It doesn't need to be the same color. In fact, quite often when I'm having communion with Rhema Family Church, I'm having a cup of coffee. And what really matters is that we understand what it symbolizes and the significance therein. And if you'll take whatever you've got to symbolize his body broken for us now, we're just going to pray over this and, uh, and then we're going to take and eat it together and just know that Rhema Family Church, as a connected family, a body in Christ, is eating together right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the generous, extravagant gift you gave us in the sacrifice of your son on Calvary. That pivotal moment in history when everything changed, death was defeated, sin was defeated, and through his body broken for us, through the stripes on his back, we were completely healed. Complete healing availed for us. We just want to take a moment right now, still ourselves in your presence. And just like it hangs in the air, your anointing, your presence, we want to inhale and just receive of the profound power of that uh, that covenant that we have with you now, that our healing 
has been completely availed. We receive your healing, Lord Jesus. Just take and eat of that symbol when you're ready. And Lord, when your blood was shed, it was finally, finally that perfect sacrifice, that spotless lamb without blemish that had been set aside specifically to be sacrificed for the remission of sins in the same way you set aside your son, that he lived a perfect and blameless life so that when he gave freely his life for us and his blood was shed, it was powerful enough to redeem all of mankind that had already been and that would ever be all of the sins that we had committed and all of the sins that we ever would commit. What a powerful, what a powerful sacrifice. Lord, we are so sorry for the ways that we've offended you, that our sins were before you and then you completely obliterated them, casting them into the deepest depths of the sea to never ever be remembered again, deliberately forgotten by you. What a powerful celebration. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Thank you that we are now blameless, guiltless, with no condemnation or shame in your presence, standing confidently and receiving full relationship with Jesus Christ, co-heirs to all the righteousness and kingdom of God. What a wonderful relationship and union with you. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the, the blood shed for us. You can take an drink of that now as well. Here's Kurt to lead us in our moment of generosity. Good morning, church. Welcome from wherever you're watching. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings this morning, but I want to read something to you. It's from the book of Mark, chapter 12. That's verse 41. This is what it says. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Okay, so here's Jesus with his disciples at the temple treasury, and they're looking at the individuals coming in to give their offerings. And many of them are quite rich uh, and quite wealthy. And you'd imagine that some of them would be looking for the recognition as they, as they walk on in. They're looking at their, their mates, you know, and probably look, you know, look how much I'm giving. But then there's this widow who comes in behind and she drops in two mites. Now, two mites to us is like two pennies or, or two cents. It's, it's hardly anything. But Jesus saw her and he grabbed his, his disciples. He said, look, look at the widow. Look, she's, she, she, she doesn't have anything and yet she's given everything. You see, the, the others were giving out of the abundance of what they had, but she was giving out of the abundance of her heart. The amazing part to this story is this, is that Jesus never stopped her from giving those coins. He never approached her and said, ma'am, I, I don't think you should be giving these. I, I see you in quite a bad situation. How are you gonna live? How are you gonna eat? I think you should put them back in your pocket and be on your way. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't want to step in between her and her financial breakthrough. So if we go to verse 44 and onwards, we actually notice there's no more mention of the widow. We don't hear about her again. But I'm sure she walked out of that temple and she got her financial breakthrough. And so I want to encourage you this morning as you give that Jesus has got your back 100%. And you may say, Kurt, well, how do I know that? Well, my Bible says this. It says that he desires above all that you prosper and that you be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Amen. We have many ways to give. You can go online at rhema.org.au slash five or through the app. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We love you so much. We think you're so awesome, Lord. And Lord, just like the, the widow who, who gave freely out of her heart and out of love, 
Lord, we give this morning because we just love you. We love you for what you did. And Father, if anyone be in lack or in need this morning, Lord, that we speak a financial breakthrough into their situations and in their circumstances in the name of Jesus. And Lord, you said that you do desire above all things that we prosper and we be in good health, Father, just as our soul prospers. Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Morning, everyone. Masu and family here. Stay blessed. Bye. Hi, church family. We'd just like to extend our greetings and let you know how much we miss you, we love you, and we're looking forward to catching up with you again in the very near future. Yeah, amen to that, Lindy. We do love you, church guys, as a family, and uh, we can't wait to be seeing you soon, so rather sooner than later, and God's good, and he's has a great plan for us, and uh, we just love you and we bless you, and hope to see you real, real soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, church fam. See you all real soon. Hi, Raymond kids. We love you. God bless. I've got the joy of the Holy Ghost. He heals me up till I overflow. I'm in the kingdom and this I know. I've got righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Good morning, Raymond Family Church. It's good to be with you again in your home. I trust you've enjoyed the service up to this point, and we have a good word, I believe a really important word from the Lord. So we're just going to scoot on up to the table, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And as we look into it today, we look in expectantly, and knowing that you always have the right word for the day. And so we ask you to help us to see what you want us to see so we can put it into practice as we go from this time together. Because Jesus said it is in the doing of the word that someone is blessed. And so, Father, help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Today we're going to look at something on the subject of light. We're calling it Light Exposes. The Bible has a whole lot to say on the subject of light. In fact, God the Father is actually called the Father of lights. But we're just going to look at one aspect on this subject, and it will be something that we can do. I was thinking this week, probably along with many, many other people, the different things that have popped up in conversations that I've been aware of, different things that you see buzzing around, things like what is really going on in China? Does anyone really know? What is happening in the government? What is the government doing? What is the information that they're giving and what are they receiving? Not just in our country here in Australia, but also in the countries around the world. What about crime networks? What's happening there? What about trafficking of humans and animals and drugs? What about the deep state? These are all really interesting conversations that maybe you've been a part of or heard of, and even if you haven't, they are certainly circulating. What's the truth? Because you don't want to navigate by something that's not true. And so what is the truth and does anybody really know? Is there a source that really does know about the truth on any of these subjects? Well, praise the Lord. God does. God does. The Word of God tells us in Psalms that actually the light and dark are the same to Him. Nothing is hidden from Him. Nothing is hidden from Him. And so everything is just as clear absolutely in broad daylight to him. So we're going to look into the word of God and look at some uh, tools that we can use uh, where these questions and perhaps others are concerned. And what can we do to move ourselves from being just a pawn in this huge global situation to actually experiencing what uh, Tony was talking about last week and taking our place in that seat of authority and working together with God in this time. 
Tony gave a verse of scripture last week that I'm just going to start off with, and that's in 2 Peter 1. Actually, this chapter is an, uh, is an amazing and beautiful parade of amazing things that God has given to us in our personal knowledge and relationship with Jesus. We're going to just start in verse 4. It says this, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceedingly great promises so that through them, those promises, we may escape from the moral decay, rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. What we can absolutely know is that by great and wonderful precious promises, we can escape. We can escape the moral decay and all of these different things that were listed. But something that I believe the Holy Spirit put in my heart this last week is the potential of this verse to be bigger than ourselves. Through, through the great and precious promises, we can, get a, uh, we can find escape from those things. But what about those great and precious promises, if we use them, can we help make a way of escape for other people? People perhaps that you know, and even people that you don't know. Is it possible? I believe so. We can pray the word, we can pray promises, and it doesn't just bring us a way of escape, it can actually navigate a way of escape for other people. So one of the promises that I believe can make a way of escape, we're going to look at right now. There are many, but we're going to look at one right now. And in Isaiah, the 40th chapter in verse three, let's start reading there. It says the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Particularly notice in this list of things that are done to prepare the way of the Lord and making a highway for our God. Uh, notice the underlined phrase here, the crooked places shall be made straight. And the reason I wanted to make note particularly of this phrase is because it's something that came up in my heart this last week in prayer. And so I looked closer into it and actually different translations, many translations actually combined rough places and crooked places together. However, when I looked up the word crooked in the Hebrew, it is the word A-Q-O-B. In the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, uh, the definition of this Hebrew word is insidious, deceitful, polluted, and fraudulent. Rough, I found, the word rough just means rough, uneven. But this word, crooked, has several uh, distinctive words that give it a different picture than just rough. So I like the New King James Version includes this phrase, a uh, unique phrase, the crooked places will be made straight. In other words, we can say the insidious or deceitful or polluted or fraudulent places will be made straight. In other words, it straightens up. Now, this portion of scripture in Isaiah 40 is actually a prophetic scripture regarding the ministry of John the Baptist to prepare the purpose of Jesus' first coming. And so uh, it is, of course, quoted then uh, regarding John the Baptist specifically. In Luke, the first chapter, in verse 76, John the Baptist's father is actually prophesying over his newborn son. And this is what he says. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way of the Lord. He goes on in verse 76 
to say this, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Notice in particular what I have underlined there, light from heaven, and that light from heaven gives light to those who sit in darkness. So we know, of course, in Jesus' ministry that he brought light to those that sat in darkness. He brought healing to them, deliverance to them, help and comfort. But the final act of Jesus' ministry actually made and brought light to us all and for all time, not just those three precious years when Jesus was on the earth. And so how did this work that Jesus did, and we're talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, how did this work affect us? And we pick that up and we find that out in Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse eight. In the Passion Translation, it says, once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. And then that verse goes on to say, your mission is to live as children flooded with his revelation light. I love that. I found a picture that shows um, the, the world at night. Now look at this. Isn't it interesting that all over the world you can see lights some places more than others. Of course, I looked at Australia and you see more light around the edges than you do in the middle. But in the places where there is light, you know that there are people. Well, if we will take that uh, to this particular verse of scripture, there are really only two kingdoms in the in a spiritual realm. And that is the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. If we had a map, actually, to uh, give illustration to where all the children of light are, if we had a map that indicated where all the people who are believers in Jesus that have had that light flood them, where they are in the globe, that would be a very interesting globe, where, uh, a picture. Would it look the same way? Well, it may have some similarities, but there are some dark places that don't have natural or uh, artificial light that actually would have light because they may not have a lot of um, electricity in that area. I know when we've gone to Papua New Guinea, a lot of times the lights that are there are there by generator or flashlight. There's not a lot of, uh, of electricity uh, that is in tiny, tiny little villages. But there are believers there. And they would show up on that map because they're a child of light. And light is flooding through them. And it would show up on a map that indicates the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Now... Let's go on and let's look at this second part of this verse of scripture. It says your mission. I think in this one verse of scripture, it's a very defining verse for anyone who is a believer. It tells them who they are, that they're a child of light. But then it tells them what their purpose is. And their purpose is not just to hold that light. It's actually to dispense, diffuse, and let it come out. Now, how does, how does a believer do that? Well, you yourself are a diffuser of light. Your very presence brings light. But not only that, Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, that you are the light of the world. And then he specifically mentions what we do, our deeds. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But not only our deeds that are right and good and true, but also 
what we say, the word. Psalms 119 in verse 130 says the entrance of his word gives light. You dispense his light through what you say. Now, what is the effect when that light is dispensed? How does it affect? Well, we see in Ephesians 5 and verse 13, just a few verses down from verse 8 that we've been reading, it says this, whatever the revelation light, and remember that revelation flood, that revelation light floods through us. Whatever the revelation light exposes, it will also correct. Who does that? What does that? Do you do the correcting? No. The light does. The light brings the correction. And everything that reveals truth is light to the soul. Now, Jesus said something interesting in John, the third chapter, after the famous verse of John 3, 16. He goes on to say in verse 19 that that people who do evil prefer the darkness over the light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come into the light because the light exposes their deeds. And so evil is often done under the cover of darkness or where others can't see it or through deception. And this is, start, this is what starts making things crooked or fraudulent is because it isn't the way it looks. All right. Jesus went on to say that they love darkness better than light. In 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, another example that Paul used is actually that a believer has a fragrance about them that comes through their union with Jesus. And so there is this fragrance that we bring. And the scripture says there in verse 14, wherever we go, we carry this fragrance. Well, this fragrance to, to believers and to people who are looking for truth is actually beautiful. But to those who don't want the truth, it's actually not a good smell. The Italian word for it, uh, a stinky, is puzza. Tu sei puzza, you stink. You may not stink naturally. And to those who love truth, you don't stink. Or to those who are curious and open to truth, you don't stink. But for people who don't want the light and are not looking yet for the truth, uh, yeah, there may be an agitation about that light and a bit of defensiveness to that light. Maybe you know that. But where is this beautiful fragrance supposed to be? Well, I think people who have this beautiful fragrance about us, you know, oftentimes we like to, to just be together. This situation where we're not able to be together in church buildings has, has really made an interesting situation where uh, we can't be together. But I was thinking about, I was thinking about, um, I was going through some, through some airport, I can't even remember where it was, but I, I had gone through the, I, it, was, it was here in Brisbane actually, I had gone through customs and I was flying to the States and I went through the fragrance department. Well, uh, you know, there's how many fragrances? And so you start squirting those things or squirting them on your arms. So you have to remember where you squirted what. And you start on one, one side of your arm. You've got, a, got a four or five fragrances all up and down. Then on the backs of your hands, it's ridiculous. And then you start having those little pieces of, um, you know, strips of paper with, with smells on them. And all of them, you know, you can prefer one over another, but they're not horrible smells. They're actually quite pleasant. That's why they're fragrances. But um, actually, this one time, I went all the way through the fragrance department and didn't buy a thing. However, I was in line um, behind a gentleman, and he smelled so nice. 
it, it, he actually, that fragrance was so nice, I thought, I've got to find out what in the world he's wearing. So I asked him. He was from some other country, and his English was broken, but I got it out. And you know what I did? In the next airport, I bought my husband that fragrance because I liked it. So in the fragrance department where there was a myriad of fragrances, that particular one didn't stand out to me. But where there were no other fragrances, there was just the general smell of human. <laughs> in the line that I was in in the, in the airport, that fragrance stood out. And to tell you the truth, I actually followed that man so I could ask him what it was. Do you know that the fragrance of Jesus can be on you? In a group of believers where there's a lot of them, and it may not stand out like it does where there's just human smell. But if the fragrance of Jesus is coming through you, it's a wonderful thing. Somebody may end up following you, following you and saying, what is it about you? What is it? And you can tell them, not the name of your perfume. You can tell them the name of the one who's changed your life and changed the way you smell. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's go on here. Uh, another way the crooked things are made straight, not only just through our personal lives and our, uh, the way that we live and, and the testimony through our mouth, but also crooked things are made straight through God-ordained authorities. Now we're going to go to Romans, the 13th chapter. And in verse 1 and 2, there's instruction for us to submit and respect God's authorities. Now, um, let's go ahead and read this portion of Scripture, starting in verse 3, okay? For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right. Okay, so we're looking at now, we're looking at policemen, we're looking at judges, were attorneys, um, private detectives, we're looking at special forces, we're looking at military, all right? We're looking at a myriad of these unique uh, representatives as of servants of God, okay? And it says here, that those authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will, they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. How, how many of you, if you hear a siren uh, down behind you, coming behind you, it's a police siren, immediately and you're on the highway, you look at how fast you're going. <laughs> you know you don't have anything to fear if you're, not, if you're not, you know, going 10 or 20 kilometers over the speed limit. So that's basically what it's saying. Do what is right and they will honor you. They'll zip on past you and follow somebody else. Now the authorities, keep, keep reading here, the authorities are God's servants. Notice that that is underlined because we want to see that these people that we've just mentioned, these different ones that are um, authorities, are from this verse of scriptures claimed as God's servants. And they are sent for our good. Immediately that pops to mind. What about corrupt people in those areas? Yeah, there can be corrupt people in those areas, but the reason why God set those authorities in place is actually to do good. The people in those places or in those seats of authority may be corrupt, but the seats themselves were God-given, and they were to do good for us, not bad, all right? Remember that, because then we'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you are doing wrong, 
of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. Whoa. Now, for the second time, it says it. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only for, to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. The King James, New King James, says they are an avenger to execute judgment. Well, God's servants in his own family, believers, we're not his servants to execute judgment and to inflict punishment. We bring words of life. We issue the mercy of God. But these civic uh, authorities do issue judgment and punishment. And you know what they do when they do? They make crooked places straight. We need them to straighten up those fraudulent, those deceptive areas that have come as a result of, of, of uh, the darkness, the things insidious, things polluted. Now, our, responsible, our responsibility then as children of light to these people is to choose, if we have that right, and in Australia we do, choose who gets to sit on those seats, those God-given seats. We get to choose through voting who sits on those seats, and then we get to respect them, we get to prayerfully support the government and authorities. And that includes uh, the ANZAC. Today, you know, I joined other people in our neighborhood at dawn to give honor to them. And we do give honor to those that are fallen. But while I was standing there with other people who were out in their pajamas uh, and some not, but while I was standing there, I thought, it is so right for us to honor those that have fallen. But do you know, according to the word of God, it is right for us to honor those who have not fallen, who are actually in service today. How do we honor them? Well, we want to look at uh, some other portions of scripture in Luke, the eighth chapter. It tells us this in verse 17. The New Living Translation says, no one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Or we could say the house, the neighborhood, the community, the state, the nation, a region of the world. God needs light so that that light can be seen by all. All right. Then it goes on to say this, for all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought into the light and made known to all. I think that's interesting. Those two verses are connected. And then Jesus, he repeated himself. And when Jesus ever is repeating himself, you know, it's not that he just forgot what he said before or that he said it before. When he repeats something, it is for emphasis. And in Luke, the 12th chapter, Jesus said the same thing, that the hidden things will be revealed. And in the verse of scripture that we just read from Luke, the eighth chapter, it is the light that exposes things that need to come to light. It is the light that exposes things that have been hid and formulated in darkness. Whole organizations of darkness that are trapping people, are hurting people, enslaving people, taking advantage of people. Crooked things need to be made straight. I had this thought too. I've read Isaiah, the 40th chapter, so many times. The 40th chapter, verse 3, in the verses of Scripture that we read there, 3 and 4. The crooked things being made straight, a lot of times, you know, a, a place where there's um, nothing wrong or everything beautiful, no crime, no injustice, everything is right, of course sounds like heaven. And it is heaven. It is heaven. 
But through the light that is supposed to be dispensed by the children of light here on this earth, there is this heavenly light that is to be dispensed here, even before we go to heaven. Does that mean that everything will be perfect on this earth? No. No, because people won't always respond to that light. They'll fight that light. In heaven, they don't. But what we can know is this, that that light does expose the darkness so that crooked things can be straight. And the result is, in, um, in also collaboration with those other things, is that the glory of the Lord is revealed and all, all flesh will see it together. Now, so let's go back to those first questions again. What's going on in China? What kind of crooked things are happening there? What kind of crooked things are happening in organizations, in crime works, in the deep state? What kind of crooked things? Well, that may always be a, a, an aspect, a point of speculation. There may be some things that uh, some people hear here and hear there, but if we pray, we are, we are engaging the light of God that is not subject to speculation. It is truth. It is pure. So I want to just give you a verse of scripture. I will not go into it, but 1 Timothy, the second chapter in verse 1 tells us that we are to pray with all kinds of prayer for kings, for all people and for kings and all that are in authority. But what do we pray? What is it that we pray? Well, there are many things that we could pray, but Proverbs, the eighth chapter, and verse 15 is very specific about something that we can pray. Proverbs, the eighth chapter, for those of you who love to read the Proverbs, would know that this particular one primarily is about wisdom. And it says this about wisdom in verse 15, because of me, or wisdom, he's talking about wisdom, kings reign. So in other words, kings reign by wisdom. And rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help. And nobles make righteous judgments. So wisdom is something that rulers rule with. Now, what is interesting is there are two different brands of wisdom. Wisdom does not only come from God and come from heaven. It also comes from beneath. James, the third chapter in verse 15, tells us this. Jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Well, then jealousy and selfishness must be some kind of brand of wisdom because it denotes this here in this verse. Such things, jealousy and selfishness, are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Whoa, that's a strong word. Yes, it is. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder or things crooked and evil of every kind. So there is a wisdom that comes up from beneath the rulers that we see on these seats of authority rule with. And if they rule with this wisdom that comes from beneath, what they do is inspired by jealousy and selfish ambition. And you will find disorder there and you will find evil of every kind. However, if there's wisdom that comes from above, the scripture goes on to tell us that the wisdom that comes from above is pure, first of all. And then it is peaceable and it's easy to be entreated. God's wisdom is pure. What comes up from beneath is impure or polluted. That's crooked. All right. The wisdom that comes from beneath makes things crooked. The thing, the wisdom that comes from above is straight. So what I'd like to encourage us all to do 
is not just pray on Anzac Day. Um, yesterday, I loved on Channel 7, there was a, a beautiful man who led in this prayer. It was such a wonderful prayer. And my heart so agreed with it as well as the people on my, in my neighborhood, they were, they were listening to the same prayer. But there are 364 other days. Let us continue to pray that God will give wisdom. You say, well, if they're, uh, if they're not asking for wisdom, then are, will they just default to that wisdom from below? They will unless we ask for it. Let's ask. Let's be diligent and vigilant to ask for the wisdom of God for those that are in authority, the servants of God that are for our good. The only way they can be for our good is if wisdom from above is supplied them. And you and I, as children of light, can ask that his wisdom flow to them as light, and that light will expose darkness. It will help them discover things that are hurting groups of people and making injustice for groups of people, taking advantage of groups of people. The hidden things will come to light. These verses of scripture are in the Bible for all time and any time that people put them into practice. I believe that in this time, it is especially important, essential, because the Holy Spirit is stirring believers up all over the world to pray more. And as they pray more, guess what? The light is being turned up all over the world. Light is being dispensed all over the world. Let's expect for darkness to be revealed, works of darkness, traps of darkness to be exposed so that God can give his love and his life and his light to the peoples of our neighborhoods, our communities, our, our regions, our state, this area of the world and the whole world. Let's pray. Let's pray diligently. We can pray these things in our understanding. And for those of you who know how to pray in the spirit or pray with other tongues, I encourage you to use that. That gift is actually a tool for your responsibility. Pray in the Holy Spirit beyond just what you would know. Pray in the Holy Spirit. And through that means of praying with our understanding the things from the word and praying with the Holy Spirit, we dispense light so that the will of God can be seen clearly. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person listening today. I pray first of all for those that are not yet a child of light because they they don't have Jesus in their life. I ask you that they would not wait one more day. That today would be the day that they say, Jesus, come into my life. Cause the darkness that has been in me and around me to go. Jesus will come in. I thank you, Father for doing a great work in people in this way. And then I also pray for the believers, the children of light. I ask you, Father, that they stand up. They come out from under the table. They come out from under their coverings and they shine their light wherever they are, in their places of business, in their neighborhoods, in their families, words of life, words of love, your love coming to the, through them wherever they are. And Father, not only that, but also for our governments. In Jesus' precious name, I give you praise and honor for the result of your light shining. In Jesus' name, amen. For more on the subject of praying for governments and for those that are in authority, I'd like to recommend to you this book. It's 
for such a time as this, praying in the last days. And much of it deals with what we were talking about, and, uh, but will also give additional information and resource to you to be able to help you in your prayer. You can get this book on Kindle Books or on our online bookstore. The link is on the screen below. God bless you. Well, praise God. If you just made a decision to give your life to Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. We want to hear about it and we want to help you in your journey of this new walk in faith. There's lots of steps that uh, you can take. So the first thing we'd like you to do, please, is head to our website, rhema.org.au forward slash live. And on that page, you're going to find a form that says, let's connect. Hit the button that gives us your details, your contact details, my life to Jesus. Now, if you are a regular member of Raymer Family Church, make sure you're grabbing that app. There is so much information there. Let's connect, prayer and praise. We really want to hear all the good things God has done for you, all the ways that he's answered your prayers in the last week or two. And we also want to join with you and agree for the prayer requests that you want brought before God. Uh, there's options to give on that app. The podcast from recent weeks will be there, pastor's blogs, and of course, all the next steps options of how you can continue to not only connect with God, but connect with each other. Thank you for tuning into Rhema Family Church today. We're so glad that you're part of our family and we look forward to seeing you next week.